a surgeon did surgery on a 13 year old. And then he called me afterwards and was nearly in tears. He was like, did I do it on too young a kid? Welcome everybody. This is Scott Hasse with the Indiana Twins and this is episode 22 of ITTV. We've got Will Carroll and we'll get into uh, introducing him in just a sec. So just a quick run through. If you are not following us on social media, everything across the board is just at Indiana Twins. We're also on YouTube. We're uploading all of these episodes at youtube.com slash Indiana Twins. Again, keeping it simple. Once this is uploaded by the end of the week, we will have kind of the show notes, so to speak, in there in the show more underneath the video. And we'll have timestamps so that you guys can click around the time and see what topic we're talking about. If you want to kind of skip around or if there's something you want to go back to and see where it was, that topic, we'll have that highlighted in the timestamps underneath. Um, anything else? If you have any questions or anything, you can go ahead and email us. Again, it's indianatwins at gmail.com. Simple again. That'll probably be me responding to most of those messages. So feel free to reach out. And today's episode, I kind of wanted to set up as let's kind of address the problem with some injuries. Let's kind of lay those out. Let's address what the problems are. And then with the power of the injury expert, Will Carroll, we are going to solve all the problems of all the injuries ever in baseball toward the end. We'll finish it off with the Twins Critique, and we'll go from there. So, Will, without further ado, the expert, the solver of all problems like a magician, go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. I wish, you know, if, if I had had that kind of power, I would have done this 20 years ago. When, when I first started doing this, I was like, you know what? If we just get everybody aware of this, everything is going to go away. And, and I can remember sitting there in 2004, uh, me and Tom House and Jim Andrews were sitting there talking about how we could get Tommy John surgery to zero. Well, we failed. <laughs> we flat failed. Uh, and Jim has made a lot more money off it than me or Tom. So it's one of those situations where it's, it's one of those things where it's my life work to get people to understand these injuries, to understand why they happen. I've taken 20 years of my life to try to get people to reduce these injuries and it hasn't happened yet. So it's not me. I'm not going to be the one that fixes this problem, but you know, I'm, I keep trying to move the ball forward. I feel like maybe I'm Earl Campbell. I'm just two yards, three yards at a time. I need, I need Aaron Rodgers. I need somebody behind me that can throw the ball. Uh, it, it's one of those situations where this problem, first we have to understand it, and then we have to like reduce it, and then we need to get as close to it as zero. And you know, honestly, I feel as good about reducing it as I ever have. We have more people that are acknowledging the problem. We have more people that understand the scope of the problem than we ever have before, both inside and outside the games. Guys like you, guys like the guys who are drafting tonight as we record this, they understand this. They can value this. But can we get – how do we get it to zero? How do we keep having kids heading to Birmingham, heading to Cincinnati, heading to St. Louis with the kind of surgeries that take a year out of their career? One of the most amazing statistics to me, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but there are two players in the Baseball Hall of Fame that have had Tommy John surgery. Can you name them? Only because I cheated and listened to you ask this question. So I know I didn't know the one, and the other one was um, Smoltz. Smoltz. Smoltz and the other one, go ahead and say it since it, cheating is a fun. Because no, I actually homework, I didn't. That's not cheating. I didn't recognize his name, so I don't remember it. But I remember he was not a pitcher. He was not a pitcher. It was Paul Molitor. Okay, I know that. I, I like recognize it. But okay, sorry. you're young. You're young. That's fine. Paul Molitor, who went from being one of the better third base prospects, injured in his arm, had Tommy John surgery, and became one of the greatest DHs in history. You can put him with Martinez and Baines, uh, and I guess Frank Thomas. Do we consider Frank Thomas DH? I think so. Uh, those guys, uh, the best DHs in history. And Molitor was the first. That's you know, a, a, a pretty good thing. Uh, I remember uh, Frank Job telling me about Tom Candiotti, who not a lot of people think of these days as you know, certainly wasn't a power pitcher, 
But uh, yeah, Tommy John surgery in the early days was something they didn't do on everybody. And, and he was in the Dodgers minor leagues. He came in and Frank said, are you a prospect? Are you any good? And he goes, yeah, I'm a prospect. I'm pretty good. And he's like, all right, let's go ahead and do the surgery. He was one of the first 10 guys that ever had the surgery. And actually, when he made the major leagues, he sent an autographed picture to Frank Job that said, I'm always going to be your prospect. And Tom Candiotti, granted, uh, not the same kind of pitcher he was at the time he had Tommy John. He was a knuckleballer. Uh, yeah, that's a heck of a pitcher. And without that Tommy John surgery, wouldn't have had the chance. So uh, we've got a lot of these guys. Uh, you know, if you go all the way back, the second pitcher and the third guy ever to have Tommy John surgery is Brett Strom, who's now the pitching coach with the Astros. Um, and the second, the second guy is a javelin thrower from Russia. His name is lost to history. They didn't keep records of it. Imagine this. You're the second guy ever, you know, what if it hadn't worked for Tommy Chong? It could be, you know, Vasiliev surgery or something. Um, so that's always been one of my life's quests to figure out who that second guy is. But Strom was the, the second pitcher, third guy ever to have it. Um, by the time, the 10th guy to have it, and this is before your time, uh, Jimmy Keith from the, uh, the, the Toronto Blue Jays at the time. Imagine that. We went from 1974 to 1982 with 10 guys, including two non-baseball players. Today we have pair surgeons that do 10 guys in a day. Uh, it, it's absolutely crazy how expansive this surgery has got and how young it's gotten. I mean, uh, I just heard a kid who was 11 years old had the surgery. And I can remember a surgeon. This is probably 10 years ago. A surgeon did surgery on a 13-year-old. And then he called me afterwards and was nearly in tears. because He was like, did I do it on too young a kid? Is something going to go wrong? Is his body going to change? And I was like, you're trying to help the kid. Yeah, we can always redo it. What's the worst that can possibly happen? It's not like... You, you, you made the kid's head this big or something. It's, it's his elbow. He doesn't have to pitch to live his life. But that's how crazy this has happened over the last decade, let alone the last 30 years. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a huge one. One of the more common things we see is just kind of, so like general shoulder soreness or elbow soreness, whether it's on the inside or the outside, the medial or lateral. Yeah. We talked about that before. Um, but could you kind of just – outline what some of the common injuries are that you're going to see in youth, whether it's either like really young to 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way up in high school and college. Yeah. I mean, the first thing you have to worry about is, is any sort of medial pain and, and medial pain is difficult. And so I'll do a little bit here. You have to remember that medial means you're, you're hopefully you can see this medial, you're in a corpse position. So you're laying down with your palms up. Medial is the inside, which isn't necessarily what you think of as the inside. It's the anatomical position, for those of you that you know, paid the college dollars to get this kind of knowledge. Uh, you know, this is medial, this is lateral. So anytime you have pain through here, you've got to worry about it. You know, over here, you're talking about tennis elbow, which mm -hmm. is painful. Uh, you know, if you're Roger Federer, well, Federer has bigger problems come today. But you know, if, if you're playing tennis, because the way the swing is, the thing all goes here, but it's, it's here where the pain comes for, for uh, a little league pitcher, uh, a pitcher at the twins level. So any pain on that medial side, you have to look at, you have to immediately go into a doctor, to an athletic trainer, you have to make sure that that's taken care of. Any sort of shoulder soreness. Shoulders are the worst. Here's the reason why. Shul elbows are easy. Elbows do one thing. Elbows are a hinge. You know, I'm not a handy guy around the house. If you ask me to fix something, I'm like, let's call the guy. Uh, <laughs> but a hinge is, is a pretty simple thing. It does one thing. So it's the same thing with a hinge joint. An elbow does one thing. A shoulder does a lot of things. Bill Alatrash, who's one of the top surgeons in the world, uh, he's the one that did Kobe Bryant's Achilles. 
He's the one that did uh, Clayton Kershaw's back. He does Tommy John surgeries for a lot of guys. What, I can remember when Jim Andrews said, when I have a shoulder consultation, I just call Neil. Uh, Neil Elitrash, he said that shoulders are like putting together a, a jigsaw puzzle when you don't have the box top. Because you don't know what they looked like before. You're trying to put like a million pieces together. Elbows do one thing, they bend. That's all they do. Shoulders, 100 different things. They've got a capsule. They've got the rotator cuff. They've got the deltoid. They've got ligaments and tendons and muscles and, and bones. It is tough. You do not want a shoulder problem. If you tear your rotator cuff the way I did, you do not want that because that's a surgery. This is funny. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, Neil Elitrash, who I just mentioned, uh, put together a conference. And out in LA, the uh, panel he put together was, uh, he was the lead asking the questions. It was me, uh, Scott Boris, the agent, and Oral Hershiser, the, the Dodgers pitcher, great. Me and Oral were the only two that ever had the type of rotator cuff surgery that Frank Job invented. And we actually had them two weeks apart. And we had never met. Uh, so we were sitting there comparing notes and scars uh, you do not want that surgery. Uh, Frank decided it didn't work, which is why we don't talk about oral Hirschizer surgery. Uh, that was a bad idea. So shoulder surgery, any shoulder pain, especially in the back of the shoulder near the rotator cuff, bad, bad. You don't want it. Yeah, I wrote down a note um, that I want to get to later when we're talking about the, some of the issues within even the medical field. Um, so I want to get back to that. But so obviously shoulder, um, elbow, big ones for pitchers, but there's also what for hitters, you've got obliques, you've got low back, low backs across the board. I mean, is there anything common that's going on with the low back, with the oblique? Common, no. What I look for is rotational injuries. I mean, baseball is a rotational game. You're, whether you're a pitcher, whether you're a hitter, you're turning. You're moving in, in that rotational plane for a hitter, no matter what side, especially switch hitters, you're going from the other side. And there are people who, uh, especially, uh, you know, guys like Alan Jader, who have looked at this kind of rotational stress. Um, Sarah Howard, I don't know if you follow her, but um, mm -hmm. trying to think what her Twitter is. LA Mobility Coach, yep, yep. I think it is. Oh my God, this, the free stuff she puts out is amazing. I wish I could afford it for uh, her consultations for all of my pictures, but she does some amazing stuff. Therapy balls, gorgeous balls. The kind of stuff she does with those kind of rotational forces and the muscles that have to be supported, amazing, amazing stuff. So those are the things I look at and try to figure out how do we you know, either strengthen these or support these through a season. Because the two things you have to remember is there's, there's kind of a two-phase system. I'm trying to get guys to the season healthy, and then I'm trying to support them so that they go through, you know, you know we all see the, the sort of ER kind of uh, uh, line, but you don't want somebody just going like this, flat line's bad, um, but you don't want them going down either. So you have to, support that strength you have to find ways to get them through the season to get them to recover and i think that recovery is the biggest portion of what we failed at i think we understand strength i think we understand build up i think we're starting to understand workload i think recovery is the piece that we've missed horribly on and, and that's something i've been focused on for the last year well, let's dive into that a little bit as we're kind of laying it all out right now because we've got we got oblique injuries from twisting, we've got back injuries from twisting, even the rotator cuff and the and the shoulder stuff and the elbow that's from twisting throughout all that. So I'm trying to think how to pose this. So let me I, let me jump in. Well, I'll, I'll get ahead of you a little bit. I think there's two things we're looking at here. The first is workload, and the first is can you put out a workload that you can support. Because, you know, you're, people think that baseball goes to failure. This isn't like lifting weights. If you want to bench press 300 pounds, there's a very simple way to do it. I'm not gonna strap 300 pounds on you, Scott. You could probably push it up. 
But, you know, um, what you want to do is start at, you know, 150, 180, 200. You're pushing up, you're working it out. You don't just strap on 300 pounds and hope you can get it up off your chest. We, we do that with pitching way too much. We tell people, hey, we're going to, uh, why don't we give you the ball and you'll go 80 pitches rather than 100. That's like 250 rather than 300. You're probably not there yet. So one of the things we have to do is build these guys up, but then you're not going to failure either. Nobody can, when you pull a guy off the mound and you've done this, you go out there and say, you got anything left? And you've had kids that have looked at you and go, nope, nothing. They do. It's not like they're an absolute muscle failure where they can't even get the bar off their chest. They can throw another five pitches and the hitters would probably put them 300 feet out. Mm -hmm. So we don't go to complete muscle failure. We go to probably about 70% muscle failure, which is pretty amazing because most sports go to real muscle failure. Yeah, you're going from a guy who's throwing 90 miles an hour to a guy who's throwing 86 miles an hour and considering it failure, it's probably higher these days. But it's that recovery phase. How do we go from coming off the mound to I've got to come back off the mound in college, it's a week later. In the Major League Baseball, you're four or five days later. How do we do that? How do we get back up? Do you get back up to 100%? A lot of times, no, you're getting back up to 90%. And then if you go to muscle failure, first, you're getting to failure quicker. And second, you're probably not getting back up. And then, oh, I'm only at 85%, 80%. You can see where this is going. That's where guys break down. So that recovery phase is something baseball has done horribly at, absolutely horribly at, and where I think the biggest gains can come. Yeah, so I feel like the pendulum just keeps swinging, not incredibly fast, but before like old school recovery was run poles. And then you had people saying, hey, let's be practical. Your, your body's been breaking down. Why don't you just once you're done, you're done and just rest. And then it was, hey, let's do active recovery. And it's all these exercises and drills and light weights and movements and massage therapy, manual therapy, all the other stuff. And then it was, well, hey, you're still adding tissue damage. So that was the pendulum swinging back. And then it's back to, you know, don't do anything. So where, where do you see that right now? What if all of them are right? I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were all right. They were just too extreme. You know, you can't just run poles. I hate running poles. It was the dumbest thing ever. Okay, everything else you said, I think there's some element of, hey, this, this can work, but we have to prescribe it right. Running poles is dumb. When, what is anything in a game like running poles? I think the one thing that I've learned coaching at, at, at Last year, I coached at University of Indianapolis, which was, and admittedly, the season was cut short. Um, but the thing we learned is that you have to do things like a game. The more you can simulate game time stress, the better off you are. You know, when you're in the bullpen before a game, you catch the ball, you throw the ball, you catch the ball, you throw the ball. That's not how it happens in a game. You've got to think about you're catching the ball. Okay, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to look at the runner. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to take the sign. We don't do that in the bullpen. Why not? So there's things that you have to do. I think we have to figure out how to burst into it because baseball, like soccer, is a burst activity. You might run I worked for an English soccer club a couple of years ago, and we learned that pretty much every player ran a 10K. But it didn't matter because every player pretty much ran a 10K. And that, they pretty much jogged a 10K. Uh, what, it, what we were looking at is the guys who were sprinting. How quickly could they get their heart rate back down? Can I get a guy out on the mound who can burst uh, you know, three outs, and then get his heart rate back down and get a good rest while his teammates score some runs and get back out there. And that's the key. So 
I would take away from the long form cardio. There's a cardio element to baseball, especially pitching. Uh, but I don't believe in like running poles, running laps. I believe in sprint work and making sure that you're doing things that actually kind of simulate a game without putting the stress in your arm of a game. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep. You're, uh, you're getting ahead of me you're, with your uh, wizardry ways and magician. You're already solving the problems. Um, let me see if, oh, my live video ended. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I can always edit this part out, but for some reason, my Instagram live was done. Oh, well. Instagram I blame Zuckerberg. <laughs> You're right. He's doing too many things. Okay, so we talked about the injuries, kind of issues like that. Um, and I added recovery, so when we start to s- solve things, we'll talk about it a little bit again. So the, the issues in the medical field, so I put down a couple notes, one of them being kind of a lack of knowledge from the doctors where they understand the human body, the human anatomy, surgeries, all those other things, stress on the joints, but they don't always understand the demands of the sport. So that could be one issue. And the other one is the adequate or really even relevant um, return to throw protocols and programs. So can you talk a little bit about um, the issues that doctors have and why that is an issue when you have a baseball player talk to a doctor with maybe no baseball background who's trying to fix it? Yeah, that, that's the first thing, is I would say, don't talk to a, to a doctor who doesn't have a baseball background. I realize you might have to in an emergent situation. Um, you know, we, we live in Indianapolis, which is one of the medical meccas of the world. There is not a doctor I would recommend in Indianapolis. There are some that if you ended up at, I would go, okay, you're fine, everything's good. If you're in Indianapolis and you need heart surgery, awesome. You're in one of the best places. If you need a hip replacement or a knee replacement, you're in one of the best places in the world. If you need Tommy John surgery, you might want to go to Cincinnati. You might want to go to St. Louis. Um, There are probably off the top of my head, maybe 15 surgeons I would trust for Tommy John surgery. That doesn't mean that pitchers I know don't have Tommy John surgery with other guys. It's not a difficult surgery. I once had the chance to do it on a cadaver, and I did it pretty well, given the doctors standing around me. So it's not a difficult surgery. It's not like other doctors can't do it. But if I'm serious about it, and I'm in, say, Indianapolis, I'm going to Tim Kremchak, I'm going to George Paletta. Uh, Tim's in Cincinnati, George is in St. Louis. If I have time, I'm going to, to one of the doctors in Birmingham, whether that's Andrews or Dugas. Um, there are only a few doctors that major league baseball players go to. Normally I tell people, I'll get a lot of people that will say, Hey, I hurt my knee. Who should I go to? Find out, you know, if you have a pro team in your city, if you have a college team in your city, go there. Because almost always, you know, if you're in Bloomington, Indiana, and Indiana University's doctor is working on your knee, you're probably fine. Um, so it's, it's one of those situations. But with, especially with shoulders, there's three guys I would go to. I mean, Wait, let, me, let, me go back, small. let me go back to elbow. So you talked about, and sorry, I'm just making sure I don't have any other questions. Thing. Um, you said the Tommy John surgery is pretty easy or pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Simple. So, so what is, is it, the int- little in- intricacies of the surgery? Is it the, the overall experience? Is it the post-op? Like, what's the difference between the 15 guys and the others? The rehab. Um, the first is that there's, there's slight differences in it. If you're going to an Andrews, an Elotrosh, an Altchek, a Kremchek, a Paletta, a Dugas, a Kane, um, you know, I, I just probably hit the names I would go to. Um, It's not a difficult surgery itself. I mean, basically all you do is you drill a hole, you drill a hole, and then you loop the the replaced tendon through there. Done. It's it's carpentry. 
there's there, there's literally a jig that you drill through that does it. So don't think it's the surgical technique that does it. You know, Neil Alatar says it's slightly different than Jim Andrews, and Dave Altchek does it slightly different than Neil Alatar. But really, it comes down to first the confidence that they've done it a million times, almost literally, and second the rehab. It's the uh, rehab that's uh, the key. And that's where it really gets broken down. Why does Jim Andrews have such an advantage? Because he has great, like he has great rehab. Why, why does Neil Elitros have such a great track record? Amazing rehab. Uh, the people he's, he's got there that he puts through. Um, I've got a hilarious Arnold Schwarzenegger story that I can't tell on air. But um, I can know part of it. Um, when when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger had his shoulder surgery, uh, he had to have you know fairly extensive rehab, uh, and ended up dating Neil Elitrush's physical therapist. And as far as I know, they're still together after about ten years. So uh, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to speak at Neil Elitrush's conference. And one of the most amazing experiences of my life was going out there with Neil and his physical therapist and a couple of the Dodgers doctors. And we had cigars with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And wow. yeah, we walked, it was funny. We were walking back from dinner and Arnold turns to Neil and I went do the bad Arnold imitation. He was like, you got any cigars? And Neil was like, yeah. He's like, good cigars. And Neil was like, yeah. And he's like, all right. And so we walked through the hotel, walked through the bar. And as we're walking through the bar, naturally, there's a guy who goes, I thought he'd be bigger. <laughs> and Arnold, without a beat, goes, yeah, so'd your girlfriend. <laughs> but absolutely amazing experience to be able to do that. Yeah. So talking about how good Dr. Andrews rehab program is so what's the issue you and i both know let's kind of tell the audience what's the issue going on with the rehab programs and the protocols and the sheets of paper that you're given and the return to throw programs what's the issue there the issue is we really can't monitor it and, and that's starting to be something um you know you're not going to be in there with a the guy every day so uh, yeah, Kevin Wilk, uh, just the, we should have like a Mount Rushmore of rehab and Kevin Wilk would be number one. Uh, yeah, we should have Jim Andrews and, and uh, Houston and a couple others, but Kevin Wilk should be up there and nobody knows his name, which is a damn shame. But Kevin is basically Jim Andrews physical therapist and has champion physical therapy down there in Birmingham. Amazing guy. He trained so many people. Mike Reinold, I'm sure you know the name. Uh, yeah, Lenny yeah. McCrina, I'm sure you know the name. Yeah. We can go down the list. But when we talk about the rehab protocols, when we talk about a Tommy John rehab, we should just go ahead and say, it's the one that Kevin Wilk wrote up in 1984. Because that's essentially what everybody is using. There's some minor variations on it, but that's about it. Um, you know, there was a slight variation in 2008 when Matt Harvey was kind of slowed down by his agent. Uh, and this is one thing we're all not Scott Boris for. He, he got out over his skis. I don't think he should have. But because Harvey took 18 months, almost everybody's taking longer, despite the fact that Harvey didn't need to. It certainly didn't help him in the long run. And most of that was the period of time between the end of the season and the start of spring training. The calendar means a lot to that. So it's one of those situations where the Tommy John rehab time, um, you know, Kevin Wilk has set that pretty much solidly at 12 to 14 months. I still believe, and I am certainly not one to question Kevin Wilk ever. I think we could get it to nine to 12 months if not a little bit shorter. If you told me we could get it to six to eight months, it wouldn't stun me. I think we'd have to have some limitations. I think maybe some things that baseball teams wouldn't like. But a lot of teams say, yeah, 
Tommy John surgery takes 18 months to come back from. Do you know why? No. Because Tommy did. Uh, Tommy took 18 months. Now, Tommy had a pretty major setback, and he had to have a second surgery at the nine-month mark, which was actually, he had to have the ulnar nerve moved, which is fairly standard. Uh, you know, there's a big debate now about whether the ulnar nerve should be transposed to begin with with the surgery or whether it shouldn't. But it took, it took Tommy 18 months in 1974. There's not a lot of things from 1974 I take for granted anymore. Maybe like a 1974 Mustang, um, but pitching and surgery, no, not so much. We should be better like we are with most things. Yeah, I agree. It's, and there's so many qualifiers and there's so many circumstantial things within anything regarding health and medicine that I'm sure if you take someone with enough qualifiers that are in line and they check the box, I think a shorter time frame would be doable. I think it's entirely possible. We've seen guys come back in nine months. Mm-hmm. Tim Kremchak brought Edinson Volquez back in, it was nine months and I want to say three weeks. And they were pushing it and they knew it. Uh, they were trying to get him back. I think we could get back. You know, I think the quickest we could get back with standard Tommy John surgery would be eight to nine months. That said, we don't have to have standard Tommy John surgery anymore. We've got an internal brace. And I think that could be, that could, that we could get a whole different time. Yeah, that'd be interesting. And then you've got what the, the, um, was it the PRP or not? The plate? Well, yeah, PRP, PRP injection. PRP is an interesting one because, okay, anytime you're talking about Tommy John surgery, you're talking about injuries to a ligament. And I don't have anything handy here, but no, that's not the right one. Take one of my old cards. So let's say this is a ligament here. So that about 25% of a tear there of this card. That's the point where people would say, well, we might as well go ahead and fix this ligament. So if you were to do 10% or 12%, that's the point where with somebody like Masahiro Tanaka of the Yankees, yeah. they did a PRP injection and he came back from it well. Uh, you got a guy like Andrew Haney, who was about a 15% tear. Whoa. Oh, that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> It'll work in, my, in your shirt. Oh, wait. yeah. Yep. 15% tear there. Andrew Haney of the Angels had, had it and came back from it well. But 25 to 33% is the point where they say, no, 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 that's not going to work. So you've got kind of a a gray area there of where can you go. Uh, PRP works great with very minor tears. If you can catch it early and it isn't significant, then yeah, absolutely, do it. At worst, you're going to wait two weeks and say, that didn't work, we're going to have to do Tommy John. But for a guy like Tanaka, it worked great. He hasn't had problems since. Right. So uh, let's go back to, or not back to, but so we've got I- issues within the medical field, now on the baseball field. Um, the issue with coaches, parents, and players not being educated. What's probably one of the most frustrating things or just areas that any of those coaches, players, parents just are really lacking information? The first issue that I have is that there's not an athletic trainer at every major practice, every major tournament. I think this. You know, I grew up around athletic trainers and sports medicine people. The fact that there doesn't have to be one around is terrible. Uh, I wish every organization like yours, I know you guys have one that you're associated with, but I don't know how often he's there. And you guys are one of the more forward-thinking organizations around. Um, But if you can't have a, an athletic trainer, uh, a physical therapist around at every practice, especially uh, American football, man, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Baseball, I understand. Um, you know, nobody's going to die on the field the way you might with American football. Um, the worst that you're going to have is a Tommy John surgery where you, you send a guy off. Um, 
So it's those kind of situations. I wish we had somebody there each and every practice so they understood it. Otherwise, I wish we had somebody that had more of a background in the physiology, in the anatomy, that understood these kind of things. But again, I don't want untrained people. Um, you know, as much as you know, Scott, I, I just, I wouldn't trust you with that kind of thing. I don't want you diagnosing kids any more than I would be out there diagnosing kids. I want somebody qualified. So I think the fact that America and baseball as a sport, the fact that we deprioritize this is really, really problematic. And that's the reason we have, we, it's the reason we accept so many of these injuries. And, and I don't think we should. I think we should be focused a lot more on prevention uh, than we should on rehab. Making a note for uh, when we get to the solution, because there was something I heard you talk about in another podcast that I want to get to kind of on the same note. Um, the issue of overuse. And well, again, we're going to get to the solution on this too, but overuse. Um, we are, I don't want to say we micromanage, but the guys, you know, myself and other board members, will kind of just kind of peek in on different games throughout the year to see what's going on with our um, teams to see what they're doing. But I know that's not the case with most organizations, if any at all, yeah. um, where it's kind of usually just your team and you go. What, what do you see happening from an overuse standpoint in youth and high school baseball? That's the problem is I think a couple of years ago, gosh, 10 years ago probably, uh, talking to Glenn Fleissig, who again, uh, associated with Jim Andrews down in Birmingham, uh, he's at the American Sports Medicine Institute, the research arm. And so again, talking about that Mount Rushmore, if you had Jim Andrews and Kevin Wilk, uh, Glenn Fleissig would be absolutely one of the third head on that mountain. Um, the research they've done on pitch counts and pitch mechanics and everything else. Um, the fact is, one of the things they've done that is great and I love is pitch smart, which is Major League Baseball's pitch recommendations. The problem is when they put those in place, there was this complete shift away from the organizations that followed those to travel baseball, which have little to no uh, restrictions at all. I don't know if when the Twins go to uh, a tournament, do you guys have any pitch restrictions at all? Yes. So uh, that was one of the things I want to talk Not about. Not just too, your is, own, but I'm saying like organizationally. Yes, organizationally, we implement pitch smart. So when you were talking about that on the other podcast, saying and people are going to travel baseball, well, there's it's wild, wild west. We see that. And I've actually been at a game, it was two years ago. I went to a game with our 16U team. Or no, they're, it was last year with our 15U team. Um, and what we just had a discussion. You or is that the organization? It is the organization. I just happened to be there at the game and just in the dugout and the coaches were frustrated and I kind of was too, but we said, it's just the way we, we go by pitch smart within like, I don't know, 10% variance. Obviously it's game to game or player to player, but no, I mean, it's across the board and that's why we do check in and make sure that they're implementing it. It's, we have it on our website. There's maybe a slight tweak that we make on kind of a second version of it, but no, our, our players know, our parents know, we make it publicly known. Our Which coaches are going by Which pitch smart. What, what I've seen uh, in a lot of the larger tournaments, whether it's, you know, Grand Park here in Indianapolis, whether it's some of the larger places, they just don't keep up with it. You know, they might, there might be one, they do it one weekend and then the next weekend they don't, uh, that there's nobody to track it, that the parents kind of fudge it. Did Smith pitch last weekend? No, of course he didn't. And that's problematic. You know, there was a situation I had a couple of years ago where a parent called me and said, hey, my son's arm is sore. What do I do? And I was like, tell me about him. And he was on three different travel teams. For kid, the kid was 13, so he wasn't even a high school kid. But he was on three different travel teams. The coaches didn't know each other or know they existed, but I have a feeling they did. Um, and why was he sore? Because he was starting for all of them. The kid was good. So why wouldn't all three coaches start the kid? He was throwing 20 innings a week. You wouldn't have Justin Verlander throw 20 innings a week. So I was like, well, he needs to go see Tim Krumchak. You know, if they're telling you he's got a UCL tear, 
you know, drive 90 miles and go see Tim, Tim Krepchak. And he had Tommy John surgery. And, and the kids come back well. It's kind of funny. He's 17 now. He's going to end up being a draft eligible prospect next year, uh, given all the things he did. But uh, th- that's been one of my problems is that for all the good PitchMart intended to do, they move people out. We, we've got a travel ball wild west, which is both, you know, there's a lot of great elements to it. I don't want to knock it. I don't want to tell anybody not to do it. But from a health standpoint, that's certainly not the way I'd organize it. Yeah, I mean, it's, we see it. I hear about it. I've seen it. I, it's in our little group messages with all of our coaches. We have literally lost tournaments. We have lost games. Yes. We have lost championships. And we will continue to because as much as we want to provide the best possible chance to win every game and try our damn just to win all those games, yes. we stop at that pitch mark guideline and whatever guidelines are, and we have lost games because of it. And we don't care. That's the problem I see is that the people that put themselves – in the right positions and do the right things also put themselves at a disadvantage. And I hate that. I hate that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. This shouldn't be a disadvantage. And I think there's ways to organize it so that it's not a disadvantage. But, uh, you know, when you have a great pitcher, it's instinct, hey, let's ride that horse. Let's see how far he can go. Look, I was, a, I was a coach at the University of Indianapolis this year, and I didn't have decision-making power. I was just kind of a consultant. But there was a game where we had a guy, Michael Witte, one of the best young pitchers I've ever seen. And this kid was dealing. He was absolutely killing it versus Sherman State. And yeah, you, you look at it, you, you look at his pitch count, you look at where he was, and – I went against every piece of data. I was like, eh, let's send him back out there. And he got torched. He got torched. And I knew it. And the, se- the second I said it, I knew I was wrong. But it felt right. There was that baseball soul in me that I want to win this game. The wrong thing to do is the wrong thing long term. I, I don't know where it would have ended up long term because that was, it was our last game of the season. But it was our second to last. Uh, and, and luckily, luckily, uh, Hugh Indy will get Mike Whitty back next year. And that's a kid who, you know, young left-hander throwing 90 miles an hour. Somebody ought to draft him. Speaking of which, how's that draft going? Oh, I know. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get you away from it. <laughs> Are they only 20 in? Really? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, the next thing I want to talk about. Oh, like, this is terrible. Years. They still haven't drafted Lang. All of baseball is screwed. Screw all of them. <laughs> I've, I, thought, I thought this was really clever. Um, I, I put in the, in the notes for kind of outline for this. It's the last thing before we get to kind of solving all the problems. Um, I said prehab yeah, is just rehab. Yeah, prehab is just rehab spelled incorrectly and mm-hmm. it doesn't exist for many people. Um, one, and I've said this many times on this show that the biggest – hurdle for us to get over that we're continuing to work toward is educating our parents to understand it's the prehab, it's the work before, it's the education before going into a season, going into competition to be able to get yourself ready for it. So you don't have to ever do a rehab. So there's, you're just able to compete, never have a rehab. So prehab, although I don't know if that's a really official word, it's the work beforehand. I can, I can remember the exact first time I heard that word. And I will tell you a funny story. Hopefully, uh, I will keep this reasonably PG. Um, it, it's a Tom House word. And, and working with Tom House back in 2002, 2003, uh, on our book, Saving the Pitcher, which I do not recommend. I always, people say, hey, I just read your book, Saving the Pitcher. I was like, no, don't. I wrote that in 2003. It's all wrong now. So don't go buy it. I'm the only guy who will ever say, don't go buy his book. Um, Tom House had me out to his uh, preseason camp in two, it would have been 2003. Um, he had some great pitchers. Uh, Mark Pryor was there, who was the model for my book. That didn't work out so well, but he's had a great career. Um, but we, the guy who I remember was Barry Zita. 
Erzito came out. He showed up uh, at this high school field in La Jolla, California. He showed up in his Mercedes uh, convertible. He gets out, and so does Alyssa Milano. <laughs> now, remember, this is, this is 2003. So Barry walks over, he starts warming up. Alyssa Milano walks over to the, this high school field. You've been to high school fields. There's like, you know, 20 seats. And she's in short shorts and has a lollipop. Sounds like a bad joke, but I'm totally serious. And Barry throws 20, 30 pitches. And Tom turns to me and goes, what do you think? And I say, I haven't looked at him at all. I have, he could not even be here. And of course, Barry Zito was just an unmasked singer of all things. Uh, but it, it's one of those things where prehab is, it's really a thing. You should build yourself up. You should make yourself ready when everything goes wrong. That said, what we want to do is avoid rehab at all. You should build yourself up to a point where you're ready to rehab. But if you build yourself up to a point where you're resilient, if you build yourself up to a point where you can accept that workload, you shouldn't have to deal with that. So prehab as a word, as a concept, yeah, I get it. Uh, but it's not what I accept anymore. I think what we have to come down to is resiliency and, and workload management. So let's go right into that. That's part of the solution, um, or at least the, the next stage of trying to solve the problem. What do you mean by workload management for those that have never heard of this? Oh, wow. Uh, workload management is a, a basically the thing you already understand. If you're going to go out and throw, I'll use round numbers here. If you're going to throw 100 pitches, you're going to need some rest. And you're going to have to build up to that point. It's not like... <clears throat> It's not like you're going to run a marathon. Um, yeah, it's a dumb story. Last year, uh, I came up with the idea that because I could ride my Peloton for 30 minutes, I could run a 5K. <laughs> I was like, well, if I can ride a bike for 30 minutes, I can run for 30 minutes, right? Kind of. Uh, turns out maybe the pounding of running has a cost. Um, but I did finish. You never want to do that. That was a bad idea. Um, but there's an idea of building up to something that you're going to build up that workload. You're going to go up and you're going to come down and you're going to build up and you're going to come down. That's workload. You know, the idea of a five day or four day rotation or even in college, a seven day rotation is built around the idea that you're going to take a load off and then you're going to build back up and you're going to knock it off and you're going to be able to kind of have a, a, a wave for it. The fact is, it doesn't work like that in most places. Again, you're not going to zero in terms of muscle failure and you're seldom getting back up to 100% because we do recovery so badly. Uh, so what we have to do is be able to figure out you know, at what point does somebody drop off? Is it better to drop somebody off at five innings where they're 50% and build them back up or six innings and then build them back up? There's so many different ways to do this. And now we have ways to measure that data. You know, before we were just guessing. I could, when I wrote the book in 2000, hold on, ooh, hold on. I actually have the book. Oh, wait. Oh. oh, there we go. There we go. This is the book that you shouldn't buy. Um, I actually conducted an experiment that one of the things we looked at was how can we tell when somebody was getting tired? And there was this thing amongst scouts is that the hitters would tell you when a pitcher was tired, which is absolutely true. But could you figure it out before the hitters? And it turns out the mothers could. We did this whole study of 100 Little League mothers, and they could figure out, without looking at a radar gun, when somebody was off 
way before even professional scouts could. Why? Because they watched their sons closer. They'd seen them a hundred times. The scout had seen them once. And, and so you, you can aim that mom radar gun at them and understand, hey, when mom says he's tired, maybe it's time to get him out there. And, and figure out how to get that through to coaches is a big thing. But on the other hand, you know, I think coaches have a hard time because you know, you've got guys, Scott, that, that you've seen a million times. And, and you know when that guy's tired. You, or you think you know when that guy's tired. His mom probably still knows better than you. But yet, can we, can we say that? Can we think that? Can we give up that control and say, dad or mom in the seats probably actually do know better than I do? Because we're so programmed to saying, you stay up there, I'll do my job. There, there's this weird kind of overlap in that where I don't want the, the parents thinking they can do our job because they can't. But there are things they see better than us. That would be an interesting, I mean, you've already done the study, but an interesting kind of way to think about yeah. yeah, so including the parents in that communication. So let's say you've got your pitching staff, you have the conversations with them, but then you also include the parents to say, hey, what have you noticed for the last eight years that he's been playing baseball? And what are the things that I can kind of pick up on? That'd be, yeah. that's really interesting. That's a good idea. Yeah, and you, I'm sure you've got pitchers like this where I say, you know, when he starts stepping off, when he starts taking a deep breath, You'll see guys who, you know, have routines. I had one pitcher this year uh, who had this whole routine and he would take a deep breath and then he would go into his routine. And it was like, well, runners are going to pick up on that. Um, but, you know, you see things that are little tweaks that, that, that come into a pitcher and, and you can read those. You know, are they taking longer in between pitchers? Are they stepping off? You know, are they throwing over more? There are a million things you can actually get. Um, and, and that's what, honestly, that's what makes a good coach. And, and one of the things I've learned over the last year, uh, the things that make a good coach, make a good parent. Yeah. And it's two di often diametrically opposed things, but it's almost all the same things. Watching parents of the kids we had at UIndy and watching the coaches, it was like, oh my God, we're looking at exactly the same things in two different ways. And if we could just figure out how to align these things, man, we would be powerful. Yep. So what would be something that in addition to that, a coach can do to monitor workload. They don't have technology. Um, all they've got, so let's take a guy who needs a lot of work with workload management, a coach that really has done nothing. The only thing he's got from data is maybe he had his guys last year and he's got the books so he can see how many they, times they threw and how many pitches per game. But what do they need to start doing this year now? Practices, games, what do they need to look at? I would say take those books and throw them the hell away because stunningly, there was a study done at the University of Florida a couple of years ago. Jason Zaremski, uh, if you want to look this up, Z-A-R-E-M-S-K-I. Uh, the work he did is God's work. He sent out graduate students. And what they did is high school pitchers that were going to start on that day, they sent grad students with a clicker. And from the time those uh, pitchers showed up, they'd be like, click, click, click. Every time they threw a pitch, it's normal pitch, click. Pitch in the game, click. Pitch on the side, click. Turns out, because Florida had pitch regulations, they could only throw between 85 and 100 pitches in game. That's what they were measuring. And these pitchers were throwing between 180 and 270 pitches on a game day. So if you thought, oh, Joe only pitched 100 pitches, this research showed they were throwing 270. Yeah, if you're throwing 2.7 times more pitches, that's just crazy. And I regularly saw this. Uh, there was a, an organization, not yours, uh, 
where we did basically kind of a combine and screw it, I'll name them because they know. I did a thing for the Indiana Nitro and we had a kid who was part of that who threw 195 throws in a single day. Now, I'm certainly not knocking this. They had no idea. He was throwing, he was warming up, he was long tossing with a friend, he got a guy going, but he had just been the guy I picked out that day, and I was sitting there with a clicker, click, 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 click. And here's a guy who's ended up throwing 10 pitches in a bullpen for scouts, and you know, who had almost 200 pitches in a day. This happens a lot. At UND, we had guys who would be like, how many pitches do you think you threw? 80. And we'd look at their data and it'd be like 170, 180. We'd be guys who, how many long tosses did you throw today? Be like 10, 15, and be like 40. Players tend to underestimate their data we think they would overestimate it, and they don't. It's really kind of stunning. So I think the first thing you should do is go out and just, if you're a coach, no data, you know, no tech whatsoever. Just pick a pitcher and a clicker, or you don't even need a clicker. Just count. You say, how many pitches is this kid throwing today? And figure it out. And then ask him at the end, hey, how many pitches did you throw? I guarantee you, you're going to see this huge delta between what you actually got and what he actually thought. And it, it's an eye opener. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things I wrote down um, I want to get back to was certification. So you had mentioned in one of the um, shows I was listening to about if you could have some base level certifications. So I'm kind of excited to tell you about how we started our own certification in-house this year we've always done kind of some education yeah. components but we basically took every coach and instructor said what is your area of expertise whether it's infield outfield pitching hitting base running whatever it is and you have to basically get certified we sent them videos yeah. and tests with it um i also made sure that all of our instructors were certified um through the concussion protocol that when i was coaching at the high school level they had done that's a free certification can you talk about maybe some other types of certifications that are out there or that coaches should be looking at or why? Yeah, there's some great ones out there. And, and you know, what you said is exactly right. I wish more people did that. You know, Driveline has a great uh, course that they do. Uh, Ref Soto has a great course that they do. Florida Baseball Ranch has a great course that they do. There are others out there. I don't want to just single out those. But the thing is, it's, it's like, what are you trying to get out of it? Um, you know, and all of those tend to be a little bit specific. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I don't think any of those are the perfect one. I wish there was something of a USA Baseball one. Um, I've worked uh, as a consultant basis with a lot of English soccer. And <laughs> this year, uh, one, of the, one of the clubs, which would basically be like single A in baseball, uh, the fourth level of Eng English soccer that I work with was like, uh, hey, we don't like your day rate. Uh, <laughs> could we pay you less? And I was like, no, I, I really don't want to work for less. So what could we do? And soccer uh, on a European level has these coaching certifications. And to be you know, the coach of you know, Tottenham, Chelsea, Man United, you've got you've got to have these continental level coaching certifications. So I was like, hey, sponsor me for this. And so I actually have one now that I could coach at a fairly high level, which would be kind of goofy, especially given the fact that NBC is doing a, a, a TV show about Jason Sudeikis doing the exact same thing. Um, I wish baseball had that. I wish we had national level certifications that you know, if you're going to be a coach of the kind of level you are, Scott, you've got to have this level of license. If you're going to be a college coach, you've got to have this level of license. If you're going to be a pro coach, you've got to have a continental A, um, which is like a ridiculous test. It's 1,500 hours. You know, it's, it, it's on the level of being a doctor. 
um, the, the fact that I got my national B was kind of crazy. So I wish we did more of that uh, as a country, uh, not just on baseball, but all sports. I think it would be good for everybody. No, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. So let's kind of move in now that we're talking a little bit about some things we're doing as well. So um, I don't know if you, I sent you a w quick blurb about, but I'll explain. So the yeah. Twins Critique is kind of one of the final segments before we get on to a little bit more about you, um, where we talk a little bit about what we offer for those watching that aren't exposed to what we do or aren't really sure what we do as a travel organization. Um, and then we get a chance to reach out and talk to the experts and get an opinion on how they think that we can do things better um, where we need to improve some things that maybe we have never thought of. So with that said, and I think I'm gonna, you might have a really good idea for something, but I might try to steer you in a certain direction, but we'll see how that goes. So with that said, uh, the Indiana Twins, we have teams all the way down from 8U, kind of our introductory team, all the way up to 17U. And then we've got our college guys that come back in and train uh, periodically. So we've got teams across the board. Um, the two main things for us that are important are number one, we're all speaking the same language. And we just talked about that. We had an in-house coaches certification this year that we kind of made official. We're going to grow from that now and we're going to have multiple iterations of it and versions, but we're all speaking the same language. So you gotta get me in on that next year. what's that? You got to get me in on that next year. I'll let you know. Yeah. We'll talk about it after. Um, <clears throat> so it's all basically all topics. You're kind of certified in all of them. So if a parent or a player or even another coach is talking to an instructor or another coach at a different level, they're all speaking the same language. We've all got our own little intricacies. But So that's number one. Number two is we're all encompassing. So it's a one-stop shop, whether it's hitting, pitching, infielding, base running. We've got 20 weeks in the offseason where we do all that. It's included in your player fees for the same cost as basically anyone locally around here. Um, we've been told many times it's not a great way to make money, but – you're gonna get 20 weeks of hitting, pitching, and mental training, and then we've got kind of mini camps for all the other topics. So with that said, and you can ask follow-up questions to get a little more specific, but is there anything that stands out to you in any of those areas that you say, you know what, I, I really see a lot of programs struggle here, and this is something you could do, or with something you're already doing, here's how you can make it better. I'll go two ways with this, Scott. The first is that I think the world of your organization I think you guys do a great job. I think you have great facilities. I think you have great intentions, which is half the battle. I think uh, the results you guys have are great. So absolutely. If I had a kid that age that was good enough to play at your level, uh, which I never was at that age, um, I would absolutely recommend this. And, and I don't mean that lightly. This isn't just because you're having me on. Uh, I've known you for years. I think the world of that organization, uh, and I don't think the world of that, uh, of other organizations in this area or around the country. The thing I think you're missing on, and I, this is not just you, I think this is nationally. I think there are a lot of people that understand how to build pitchers up. I think there are a lot of, and I'm a pitcher guy, so hitters, I'm sorry. Um, I think there's a lot of people that can build pitchers up. I think there's a lot of people that can work on pitching mechanics. I think there's a lot of people that can work on kind of pitch design. I don't think there's a lot of people right now that are focused on recovery. And I think that's 25 to 50% of the, the, the real equation. And so this is not just you. I think this is everybody. If, if I was coming in and you were saying, Will, how can I make my, my uh, project 25% better? It would be, I think, uh, you know, through the use of meditation, through the use of yoga, through the use of sleep, uh, the use of sleep, the monitoring of sleep. Those are the three things I think you can immediately get better on because I don't think as Americans, we recover well. I completely agree with you. Um, so we have, and I, I'm glad you kind of pushed that because we have dabbled in each of those areas. Um, more so the yoga, well, more so sleep and tracking kind of some. Uh, have you done scores. yoga nidra? What's that? Have you done yoga nidra at all? Hmm. See, yoga nidra is one of those things. This is, this is one of the things that I've really 
locked in on over the last 12 months is yoga nidra is kind of sleep yoga, uh, which kind of seems weird, but can you make your rest more functional? Can I take less sleep and make it better for me? Can, are there ways to nap and, and replace the sleep I should have gotten? Because we're not natural creatures. You know, if you watch, I'm obsessed with this show called Alone. Have you seen this? Mm-mm. Ah, it's on History Channel. The, these people go out to like Mongolia and live for a hundred days and try to survive. And uh, they're not super active. They go out and kill a moose and then they sleep for 12 hours. And, and you know, they starve for 12 days and then they eat a moose for a couple days. And, and then, but it, it's kind of crazy the natural cycle of what our bodies were versus our modern society. We, we don't have that. You know, I realize pandemic has kind of made us crazy and, and, and sleeping 12 hours a day. We may be supposed to be, except for the whole inside part and not eating a moose. Um, but I, I just don't think our bodies are near what they're supposed to be naturally. And that recovery, that, that cyclic nature of it, uh, yoga nidra is one of the things that I absolutely love for that. And, and getting my pictures into that at UMB last year was one of the things I think was really one of the most important things. I'm going to have to look into that for sure. Um, so my, my daytime job as a health coach and personal trainer, that's something I haven't looked into. I felt like I've learned about a lot of different things, but I'm going to use that because you're right. Taking care of our body, your mind, our breathing, all that stuff. It's just self-care is not very high in priority lists. Okay, so with that said, let's um, kind of pivot toward closing shop here. So where can people find you? Is there anything you're wanting to plug? Um, go ahead and the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. I, I just love talking pitching. So um, if you want to follow what I do, um, do it at underthenife.substack.com. That's my regular column. Uh, it's free all the way up until opening day, whatever the heck that may be. Uh, and we've got the uh, MLB draft tonight. Uh, they don't know where to send these guys, which is kind of crazy. Um, we've talked about all sorts of things from how to get ready, uh, workload basis, uh, all sorts of things. But uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Injury Expert, which is because Will Carroll was already taken. Uh, so it's kind of fun. Awesome. Is there any other closing thoughts you've got? No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And hopefully I've uh, helped some people with uh, a little nugget here or there. Absolutely. Well, I'll have you stick on for a minute. And from that, I guess we are good to go. I appreciate it.